keep in mind, P. Diddy, no one heard him say, Tom, you hear something about P. Diddy, all right, and you hear about his denials, and then you see him win one little victory after another. It does beg the question or about his guilt or his innocence other than what he did on the court on video to his girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, that he beat up in a, a hotel hallway, okay? I, other than that, I know nothing about what is going on with Sean Diddy Combs. I'm not wishing the worst or the best for him. Let the evidence allow us to determine that. But we're going to talk logically about what's transpiring with his situation right now. He's trying to get out on bail. This is like the third attempt where he's going to try to do it. They've nixed it two other times. I'm predicting they're going to do it again. I know just recently they raided his cell. And when they raided his cell and confiscated some material where he wrote some stuff down, the defense attorneys representing Diddy took it to the judge, and obviously the judge overruled it and made sure that whatever they obtained was inadmissible and more importantly, it probably had to be returned. Here's the deal. Those little victories, and they are victories because it curtails you from being able to use that evidence against them, still doesn't negate a bigger point. To let him out on bail, you have to take into consideration the potential ramifications. You gotta take into account why he's in jail in the first place. When you look at the Southern District of New York and the case that they have put forth against him with these bevy of allegations, understand that one of the things they were saying is that he would intimidate witnesses. That if he's out of jail, and he has access to a phone at his discretion, access to his people at his discretion, access to emails, access to iPads and laptops and all of this other stuff that he could potentially influence potential witnesses. They're not going to let that happen. To me, if he's granted bail and he's allowed to have that kind of access because he's a citizen that's roaming free because he's let out of jail, that's going to drastically impede and hamper their case. And they're going to do everything they can to make sure that that does not happen. To me, if he's able to pull this off, he shouldn't have been there in the first place. They shouldn't have been allowed to get him in jail in the first place. The fact that they were allowed to, combined with the fact that he was denied bail not once but twice, and these allegations continue to grow and grow and grow. I'm talking about allegations. Not evidence, not proof per se, but allegations. The fact that they continue to mount does not put him in a greater situation at all. Now, y'all can decide whether you want him out or you don't. That's your opinion. It ain't going to influence the courts. But you can decide. We can stand here right here on this show. Are we being fair to him? I think this show has been very fair to him. I think a lot of things have been going on. There's been no decision on the bail yet. There's been no decision. Let me be very, very clear about that. So the judge ruled no decision will be made until next week. Okay, we're fine. We're fine with that. My question to y'all out there, right here on the Stephen A. Smith show, should he be granted bail? Based on the accusations, the Southern District of New York is levied against him. Homeland Security raided his homes in both Miami and Los Angeles. When they arrested him in New York, they knew he had come to town to turn himself in. They still showed up at the hotel waiting for him to roll up in the hotel lobby before they sent them out in cuffs with a little perp walk to boot. They're not playing. And they believe their case against him is pretty damn strong. We had both Eli Honig and Ryan Smith, CNN and ESPN respectively, legal analysts in their own right, come right on this show and explain that there's a whole mountain of evidence against him and it doesn't look very, very good. He could still plead out or he could potentially win the case, but it looks daunting to say the least which means that they believe somewhere along the way there's an element, if not a bevy of truth, attached to the litany of allegations that have been thrown upon him. Under those circumstances, do you all believe that Sean Diddy Combs should be released on bail until his trial in the spring? Before you answer that question, right on the Stephen A. Smith show, I would ask this. Do you believe that if he is granted bail, that he will do absolutely nothing to communicate with and potentially influence witnesses scheduled to testify against him? 
Or do you think he'll just sit at home and chill and do nothing with his life on the line? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. It's a legitimate question. Take it into consideration. But obliged to begin with the latest on Sean Diddy Combs currently sitting in jail awaiting trial on federal sex trafficking and racketeering charges. P. Diddy Combs and his legal team scored a victory yesterday when the judge overseeing the case said prosecutors are not allowed to use jailhouse notes taken during a raid of his cell. Combs reportedly had 19 pages of handwritten notes for his team and the judge ruled those notes are subject to attorney-client privilege. Combs' legal team scored another legal victory yesterday when the judge ruled the music mogul can appear in court without shackles around his legs. By the way, Combs has another bail hearing set for this Friday. I think when we see something like that, ladies and gentlemen, it just gives us an indication that you can't rule anything out. He's Sean P. Diddy Combs. He's worth over a half a billion dollars. Obviously, he can afford the best lawyers, the best legal minds available are available to him. And when you look at something like this, albeit minute in the eyes of some, he's still in jail. OK, he doesn't appear to be getting out before April or May, something along those lines. And when you see something like this, you're like, what's the big deal? So what? He won the case. Well, take this into consideration. If you have law enforcement officials and prosecutors raiding your jail cell to take your private notes because they believe somehow, some way, you're making a concerted effort to, to influence potential witnesses against you, all right, and the judge rules that not admissible and they're not able to use that kind of stuff against you, that's very, very beneficial. Everybody else has to show up in court essentially with shackles on, but he does it. Now, some people will sit up there and say, okay, again, that's not a big, big victory, but image and perception does matter, even in the court of law. Why? Because there's jurors involved. And when you roll up in there looking like a prisoner, that hurts. He still won. Perception doesn't escape reality, but sometimes in the minds of a few, it potentially can. And every time you hear something about P. Diddy, all right, and you hear about his denials, and then you see him win one little victory after another, it does beg the How question. How much winning is he literally capable of doing against the Southern District of New York and beyond in terms of the cases that are being levied against him? I'm looking at stuff like this and I'm watching it with a fine tooth comb because I want to see how many small victories is he going to accumulate in an effort to ultimately get himself out of jail. Yes, he's in prison right now. He's in jail right now. Okay, right there in Brooklyn, New York. He doesn't appear to be getting out anytime soon. There is going to be a trial that's taking place this spring. We know all of that. But anytime you've got situations where evidence is considered non-admissible and the prosecution can't use it against you, that makes it harder for you to accumulate the level of evidence to get at him about. We heard about the sex trafficking. We saw the video, the damning video where he was beating up his former girlfriend, Cassie. We saw all of that. But in the end, when he's sitting there and he's talking, everybody bringing up a thousand bottles of baby oil and, you know, videotapes of, you know, and, 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 and freak offs and all of this stuff. Keep in mind, P. Diddy, no one heard him say, excuse me, I'm innocent. It never happened to the courts. What they're saying is that it was consensual amongst adults. And because of that, as his lawyers intimated when I was watching them on, on programs like News Nation or CNN or what have you, what did you hear them say? You might find his behavior reprehensible. You might find it disgusting. You might find it a lot of things. The word we're concerned about is whether or not it was legal. And if it was legal, meaning consensual, non-forced, then all of a sudden it gives you a reason to believe there's a possibility he could get off. Now, I'm not casting aspersions or any kind of judgment on anything involving P. Diddy outside of that video. That video, that's evidence. We all saw that. And there's a discussion to be had about the statute of limitation on such a violent act against another human being, particularly a defenseless woman who happened to be his girlfriend. That is non-debatable. We saw what we saw. Everything else, everything else, speculative. They got their case. 
he'll have an opportunity through his defense lawyers to present his, at which time we'll be able to judge. A lot of times we're sitting back and we're assuming because somebody's in jail, they're automatically guilty, even before the trial took place. Diddy is saying something else. He's saying, hell no, he's not going out like that. He's not guilty. And when we see stuff like this happen. But because of the power of Diddy, which is so loud as far as a pop culture icon, nobody listened. Um, so I moved mm -hmm. on and, and, and I, I pivoted my life to healing, to forgiveness and to taking accountability for what I can control. And I can't control what someone did to me decades ago. I can't control them not wanting to pay reparations, not wanting to, to make right. You know, if people say, oh, Diddy gave me millions to, to go to jail, nothing. Probably made uh, a two, what I thought were offensive uh, contributions over the last 20 something years, which led to a breakdown in, in the relations. Um, but I moved on. So, so yes, was I the sacrificial lamb? Of course. Did I take the fall? Yes, there was no quid pro quo. There was not, listen, we're going to have $10 million waiting for you when you come out. I'll just do the right thing. I did that on my own, uh, you know, and, and, and I've been saying that. It's not, it's not anything new, but, but in the documentary, right. just like in this interview, I can't say to you, Stephen A., I don't want to talk about uh, Diddy. Let's talk about me becoming the prime minister. Let, let, you know, I can't no. talk about only what I want to talk about. I have to be fair mm -hmm. and transparent uh, to the audience. Uh, but I, I, I've been saying the same thing if you do your research. Um, but he, listen, he right. also mentored me uh, at, in, in the year or so we spent working together to, to make one of the greatest hip hop albums ever. You know, I learned a lot as far as being an entrepreneur, uh, as far as being, you know, a disruptor and a trailblazer. Um, and so I got exactly what I went to, to the university uh, a, a bad boy uh, with Diddy as professor when it comes to entertainment and, and even things that I've been able to carry with me as far as work ethic, as far as, you know, manifesting the greatness that you want to achieve. You know, so there, there were some positives. On when they ask you, because inevitably, at least in the United States of America, they're going to ask you, did you hear anything about P. Diddy? Did you hear what happened? How do you feel about what happened? What are you going to say about him? if anything at I, all, at this point I, I in time pray, in your life. I pray for uh, the victims. I pray for people like Cassie, who has been proven that she's a victim, and, and everyone else. I'm not sure the credibility of everyone else. But I, I pray for the victims, and I, and I pray for Diddy. I, I pray that he's able to do some soul-searching, and even if he's not guilty of, of the, the accusations, um, there's a reason he is where he is right now, and it's up to him to communicate with God and and to try to cleanse his soul and uh, pivot and move forward and, and redeem himself. Uh, and I pray that he's able to go through that journey and that he has success because the same way I was rehabilitated and I reformed myself, I'm not here to condemn anyone in perpetuity. You know, I, I hope that, that uh, justice is served. If he's not guilty, the judicial system will decide that if he is. I hope that he, he's contrite and he turns his life around. And I hope that the victims can get closure. Direct question. When you, it, you've made it very, very clear and the people who love you have made it very, very clear. You got a bad rap. You took the rap. You suffered because of it unfairly. Is that a roundabout way or not an indirect way of saying it wasn't you? It was Diddy who did that shooting in 1999? I was defending myself. So I, I would never say that um, I did not fire in self-defense, but the question is, who else fired? Uh, the, the reality is, the fact is, there were shell casings found from two other guns, uh, in addition to mine, shell casings that did not obviously match mine. The uh, forensics never took the, um, the ballistics out of the victims. So we don't know who shot the victims. And according to one victim, gotcha. Diddy shot her. Uh, and and th those are just the facts. Uh, I maintain that I was acting in self-defense, and I continue to say that. And so I'm innocent in the sense of I did not uh, intentionally try to hurt anyone. I was defending myself. But what complicates it is that 
two other people or two other guns were fired. Um, and and mm. the victim says, did he shot her? So uh, that's the reality. Right. So. And done with. 100%. But let me get to Diddy for a second with you. NDA, non-disclosure agreement. We read these stories. We hear TMZ talking about it. A lot of people are thinking Diddy may end up winning because you know what? These NDAs may be enforced and nobody may say anything about them. How real is that possibility, Ellie? I would not be overly optimistic if I was Sean Combs or his defense team because of these NDAs. I don't think they're going to do him much, if any good, in his criminal case. Now, here's the deal. NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, they sound bad. They're usually not great. They don't look great, but they're not illegal. Ordinarily, they are legal. Corporations enter into them all the time. There are valid purposes for NDAs and there are invalid purposes. And what courts are going to ask, if somebody like Sean Combs says, well, this person can't testify me against because he or she signed an NDA, the court's going to ask, first of all, is this bad for public policy? And second of all, did the person fully understand what they were signing? Are the terms clear? Did it make sense? Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that the terms were clear on these NDAs. I'm not so sure that's the case. But then the court's going to get to the other question, which is, is this against public policy? Would this be a bad idea? And the one thing that NDAs absolutely cannot overcome is a criminal investigation. You cannot avoid testifying in a grand jury, testifying at a criminal trial, turning over evidence by saying, well, I was a guest at one of these events and I signed an NDA, therefore I can't break the NDA. That will not work. Prosecutors will tell you we don't care about the NDA. FBI will tell you we don't care about the NDA. And the law will tell you that in that situation, the NDA does not protect Sean Combs in a criminal case. Well, then what the hell are we missing, Ellie? I mean, when folks <laughs> sign an NDAs, I mean, I mean, we're thinking that this that provides some level of security for the people who drew up the NDAs because they don't want folks talking their business and they don't want people slandering them, maligning them in any way. If you're telling me the FBI, the district attorney's office, the courts, et cetera, don't care about it, then how significant is an NDA in today's society? Yeah, so we see these, like I said, all the time. Corporations have people sign them. Donald Trump famously had people sign NDAs if they worked for him. Uh, in other terminology, sometimes people call it hush money. Here's the way they do work, though. Let's assume everything's on the up and up. Let's assume both parties understand what the NDA means and they sign it willfully and voluntarily. Then the way it does work is if somebody speaks out publicly against Sean Combs outside the context of a criminal case, then they can be sued. And this is what sort of Donald Trump's NDAs are. A lot of us may not even realize that we've signed them. When we signed contracts to work for certain employers, there's often an NDA in there that says you cannot, after your employment, disparage fill in the blank organization. And if you do, then under this agreement, we get to sue you. Sometimes it says specifically how much money. It could say some crazy amount, $10 million, whatever. And sometimes it just says we get to sue you for damages. So the reason they do work is again, assuming that they're sort of written up in a legal way, they can mm -hmm. actually be used to prevent somebody from speaking out in a public, non-criminal setting. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because if you know that and you're educating us about that, you certainly can surmise that Diddy's lawyers know that, yet and still, they file paperwork with the Southern District of New York on Sunday asking the judge to order potential witnesses in his criminal case to be quiet. What do you make of that? No chance. No chance that motion gets granted. No federal judge is going to say, well, you signed an NDA, therefore you can't be a witness at this trial. Now, judges do and sometimes can and sometimes do, Stephen, issue what we call gag orders. Again, we saw some of these in the Trump cases where he says, OK, parties to the case, federal government, DOJ, Sean Combs, maybe sometimes even witnesses. You're not to make out of court public statements because I don't want you to uh, uh, potentially impact the jury pool. I don't want to create pre-trial publicity that may be harmful to the defendant. Here's Sean Combs, who does have constitutional rights. So you might see a court say something like that, but no judge on the planet is going to say, oh, well, I guess we, the criminal courts, are out of luck because you signed an NDA, so therefore we don't get your evidence. That, imagine if that was the case. Imagine if you could keep someone off of the witness stand or out of a grand jury by just making them sign an NDA. You would, you would allow rich, powerful people to avoid accountability like crazy. You just go, oh, sorry, can't testify. You sign mm. this thing. What is it that people are saying? They're saying that this Diddy NDA is not a standard NDA. What's different about this one if it's not a standard one? 
Also, it's interesting. There, there's no one size fits all. I'd be interested to see the specifics of what's in it. But what judges are going to look right. at, basically, look, there are, if, if you just went online and Googled sample NDA, you would see samples and lawyers use samples all the time. The key things that a judge is going to evaluate. So let's say, hypothetically, one of these witnesses went forward and did an interview. Forget about the criminal case, but did an interview with some with TMZ, let's say, and said, here's what I saw at this event where I signed uh, an NDA. And then Sean Combs said, oh, you violated the NDA. Now I'm suing you. The first thing the court's going to do is let's look at the NDA. Are the terms clear? Are they fair? And is it bad for public policy to keep this person from talking? A lot of times these NDAs are very unequal in terms of the bargaining power, right? You just, you don't even look. Yeah, sure, I agree. You know, these people are often, I assume the people who are signing these were not represented by lawyers. So I think there's going to be some problem enforcing these NDAs anywhere. But again, definitely not in criminal court. Is it true that some of the Jane and John Doe victims have to be revealed in this case? Is that is, is that true? Eventually, they absolutely will if they're going to testify at trial. It is absolutely standard procedure, Stephen, that at this phase, and we have an indictment, but we're moving towards trial, prosecutors are going to protect the identity of those witnesses, I think, for obvious purposes. They don't want people being intimidated, tampered with. And so, yes, you often will say something like John Doe, Jane Doe, witness one, generic terms. But if and when there's a trial in the state, and I think there will be, then the people have to take the stand and they can't be anonymous in some very extraordinary situations, usually involving someone who's a minor. There's ways to protect that person's identity. The defendant would still know who it is, but to protect that person mm -hmm. from the public. I actually did that once. We had a 16 or 15 mm -hmm. year old who had witnessed a robbery. And we were able to allow him to testify under certain circum, you know, sort of more confidentially than normal from another room by video feed. But ordinarily, once you put someone on the stand, you have to identify that person to the defense. And anything that happens in trial, Stephen, is public record. You or I could go watch. You can get the transcript. So, yeah, eventually these people's uh, identities will be revealed. But look, the government, uh, when I say government, I mean prosecutors and FBI, they have an obligation right. to protect these folks and make sure that they're taken care of mm. and make sure that they're not threatened or endangered. So you, you weren't here weeks ago. Compared to weeks ago, to where we are right now, in light of the inordinate amount of information that has come out, whether it be NDAs or anything else, is Diddy in any kind of better situation now, at least perception wise, than he was, dare I say, six weeks ago, anything like that? No, I think he's in a worse situation. As far as we can tell, and we always have to say we're not on the inside. We don't know what's happening behind closed doors. But here's the biggest thing that's happened, Stephen, since we last talked. There's been a slew of civil lawsuits, right, that have come forward and alleged, again, not criminal, but sued Sean Combs and said that he has sexually assaulted and harassed people. Now, here's what prosecutors are going to do. They probably already knew about some of these folks, and so fine. But I assure you, some of these people were previously unknown to prosecutors. Now, as a prosecutor, you don't, you don't just take someone who's sued and go, well, that person's good to go. We're going to put that person on our witness list. But you absolutely are going to check that person out. You're going to ask the lawyer, hey, I saw the allegation. I'd like to speak with this person. You're going to cross check Stephen their information. A. Smith, the outspoken sports commentator and television personality, has long been known for his controversial takes and bold opinions. But in recent months, Smith's attention has increasingly focused on one of the most prominent figures in entertainment, Sean Diddy Holmes. The tension between the two began to build as Combs faces a series of serious legal challenges, including accusations tied to RICO, racketeer-influenced and corrupt organizations. Smith's repeated commentary on Deddy's situation has stirred public debate, with some seeing his remarks as an important part of holding a celebrity accountable, while others view them as uncalled for attacks at a time when Combs is awaiting trial. Diddy, whose career spans across music, fashion, and business, is no stranger to controversy. From founding Bad Boy Records to his ventures in vodka and clothing lines, Combs has been a dominant figure in entertainment for decades. However, his name has also been linked to a variety of scandals, from violent altercations to accusations of using his influence to intimidate others. In recent years, these legal issues have escalated. Combs is currently under investigation for various RICO-related offenses, with prosecutors alleging that he may have used his network and connections to engage in illicit activities. The most high-profile aspect of Diddy's legal woes involves indictment on multiple charges, including 
organized crime, and racketeering. These charges are related to allegations that he built a criminal enterprise through his businesses and personal relationships, taking advantage of his position of power to intimidate and manipulate others. This case is still in its early stages. While these legal issues are significant, one of the most damaging aspects of Diddy's public image is the ongoing scrutiny of his personal life. A particularly unsettling incident that continues to haunt him involves a disturbing video showing the physical abuse of his ex-girlfriend, Cassie Ventura. The video depicts him in an altercation with Cassie, sparking public outrage and calls for accountability. While the footage itself was only part of a larger pattern of allegations against Diddy, it remains the most substantial piece of evidence against him in the court of public opinion. This incident has only served to fuel the narrative that Diddy is a dangerous and abusive figure, a narrative that has been perpetuated in the media ever since. However, it is Stephen A. Smith who has emerged as one of the most vocal critics of Diddy in recent months. Smith's regular commentary on Diddy's legal troubles has drawn attention due to his reputation for calling out public figures, regardless of their stature or influence. As a figure with a massive platform, Smith's opinions carry weight, and his comments have been pointed and frequent. He has criticized Diddy for the accusations against him, questioning whether the mogul's fame and fortune have allowed him to evade serious consequences for his actions. His criticisms of Diddy are hardly new. Over the months, he has made no secret of his distaste for the media mogul's behavior often pointing to his alleged mistreatment of others, including employees and colleagues. But with the latest legal charges, Smith has escalated his attacks, suggesting that Diddy's actions are not just a matter of personal failure, but indicative of a larger pattern of abuse of power. Smith has remarked that it's time to face the consequences of his actions, regardless of his influence in the entertainment world. He has also stated that Diddy's fame should not exempt him from accountability, and that the justice system needs to treat high-profile individuals like any other person facing criminal charges.